Very happy to be with you, um, all the way from sunny Southern California. Just in case you were wondering, I brought the weather along with me. But it won't stay very long, because I have to go back on Monday. So, And then winter will set in well and truly. I'd like to thank the Bonson Institute for the privilege of speaking this evening. It's a wonderful opportunity as we kind of launch the uh, public exposure of the Bonson Institute. It's kind of risky business for the board, though, when you ask a geezer like me to reminisce about his best friend ever. Um, how much time did you say I had? <laughs> like Robert Frost said, we know how one way leads on to way, and we may never come back, but I'll try to stick close to my notes I uh, have to say that uh, preparing this, you know, most of this kind of preparing, you don't need commentaries, you don't need the Greek or the Hebrew, you just have to remember a lot of things, and um, it's a kind of a bittersweet uh, experience for me. I, I sort of feel myself going into a different zone, and so I, uh, yeah, um, it'll be good for me to stay close to the text, both for time purposes and uh and for my own sake. Um, I was thinking about what might be most interesting and helpful to you in the audience tonight. You're far, far away from Southern California, so you weren't part of Greg's personal world. You didn't hear a lot about him. Most of you know him either from his books or from his uh, recorded lectures or some combination. Some of you perhaps heard him. Uh, during his lifetime, speak someplace or other in the country. Um, and so the question is, do you really know Greg Bonson? Is it necessary to know the man himself? How does the real person stack up with his public persona, or now, in this case, with his public reputation? A reputation which, in my judgment, was often shaped most profoundly by those who were most critical of him, both theologically and apologetically, and sometimes even professionally and personally. And I have to say, my perspective is not neutral. Um, you could find others that perhaps will give you a different take on certain instance in, uh, incidents. And because I necessarily have to abbreviate a lot of the, the recollections, I would uh, draw your attention to that book out on the table called The Standard Bearer. It was the um, Feshrift for Dr. Bonson that was printed several years ago. And the first chapter in that book is written by his son, David. And it is a kind of a, a biographical inter introduction to Greg. So if you want more details from a slightly different angle than my own, I would point you in that direction. Like all of us, Dr. Bonson had his strengths and weaknesses, and he changed over the years. Now, his theological convictions, as certainly his bedrock foundational ideas about theology and apologetics did not change, so people who only know him through his works might think, well, he, there really isn't a man in time here. The things that he presented at the beginning, he presented at the end of his life. But for those of us who were living with him and living through his life experiences with him, we saw those changes, that maturing, that development of him as a man, and it was wonderful to see. He was a controversial figure throughout his ministerial life, from the mid-1970s all the way through to his death 20 years later. And he was a young man when he died, 47 years old. And I was thinking again, what, uh, what would a 70-plus-year-old Greg Bonson have accomplished? What might he look like? What might he sound like if he was standing before you tonight instead of me? I personally am here today as a Reformed Christian and as a minister of the gospel because God brought Greg Bonson into my life when we were college students at Westmont College in Santa Barbara. Just a few quick biographical notes to get the story going. He was born in Auburn, Washington, September 17, 1948. A year later, his father, in search of work, relocated the family to Southern California. So Greg grew up in Southern California. He was very self-conscious about being a Southern Californian. <clears throat> 
uh, grew up in Pico Rivera, which is in South Los Angeles County. When he was in the fourth grade, Greg began attending with his family Beverly Orthodox Presbyterian Church in East Los Angeles. That church was Greg's ecclesiastical first love. Through, though Greg's lifelong experience with the OPC was rocky, unlike others who became exasperated with denominations, he never believed that he could be better off elsewhere choosing the road of independency. Not surprisingly, Greg was a first-rate student throughout his years of school, but he wasn't an egghead. He loved rock and roll music. He played a four-string guitar. I'd never seen a four-string guitar before he pulled one out to lead some singing in a youth group meeting one time. He was involved in lots of extracurricular activities as a student body president, as a senior in high school. He enjoyed sports, mostly football, and would play until his heart condition made that impossible. Then he watched it, and he was especially uh, enthusiastic fan of USC football. Go Trojans. <laughs> it was at an OPC youth camp when he was in the ninth grade that Greg began to sense God's call to pastoral ministry. And from then on, he had but one goal in view. He would prepare himself for the ministry of the church. He was going to go to Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He was going to study at the feet of the renowned Reformed apologist Cornelius Van Til. He would serve the church and defend the faith. This is where I came into the picture. As I said, we met at Westmont College as entering freshmen in 1966. Dennis Johnson, some of you know him, a recently retired professor at Westminster Seminary, California, was a mutual friend. He and Greg were pre-ministerial, uh, on a pre-ministerial track, and Dennis and I were English majors together, and so Dennis was the one that brought Greg and I together and made the introductions. We were together then as students for the next seven years at Westmont College and then at Westminster. We graduated together in 1973, but then our paths diverged, at least geographically, for the next decade until we were reunited in Southern California in 1983. Even through those years, we kept in regular contact with one another. Now, there's lots that I'm going to skip over here fast forward, but I do want to just um, refer to one uh, telling incident from those college years. The first thing I really remember about Greg dates from before we, were, we became personal friends. He was writing letters to the editor in the college newspaper, not identifying himself, but signing his letters, Balaam's Ass. <laughs> Initially, he was writing to protest the college administration's plan to open up the school library on Sunday afternoons for student use in study. Now, to my broadly evangelical young mind, that sounded like a brilliant idea. Go to church in the morning and study in the afternoon. What could go wrong? Well, Balaam's ass had a problem with all of that. He was opposed on the basis of this Sabbath principle that he claimed to find in the Bible, in the creation account and in the fourth commandment. And he cited frequently from something called the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I in those days had never heard of. There was a firestorm of reaction, both from fellow students' letters that were published subsequently and from clarifications of the policy by spokesmen for the administration. But Balaam's ass held the line. His reasoned arguments were not refuted. Instead, he was harshly judged as unlovingly legalistic and ridiculed as hopelessly out of step with the times. For my part, despite my initial inclinations, I found his argument compelling. I was drawn in to his exposition of particular biblical passages and the application of Scripture, and so I began to become a Sabbatarian. That little story, I think, epitomizes the whole of Greg's life 
and ministry for the next two decades until his death. And the choice of his pen name is significant, Balaam's Ass. That's how Greg Bonson saw himself. If God can tell the truth through a donkey, he can speak through a man. That's why I'm really not sure he'd be all that steamed up about something called the Bonson Institute. And you know, we get, we're given to a hyperbolic kind of age, so when I hear people say, with every good intention, that Greg was the greatest something or other, he really wouldn't like that talk very much. He was Balaam's ass, but he was speaking the truth, and it was compelling. <clears throat> During the spring break of our senior year, 1969, Greg asked Dennis and I if we wanted to go to a student weekend hosted by Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, Santa Barbara to Philadelphia. We agreed, and so the three of us packed ourselves and our stuff into my VW Bug, and we drove straight through from Southern California to Philadelphia, 56 hours in case you're interested. We met professors, we sat in on classes, and we all decided then, well, Greg knew already, and I think he knew that he would tempt us into it, that Westminster was just the place for the three amigos from California to continue their education. We were the three amigos before there were three amigos. Then we jumped back in the car and drove all the way back home again, another 56 plus hours, and several extra hours in Texas with a broken fuel pump. Our three years together at Westminster represented more chapters that I have to leave out of tonight's presentation. But again, um, a couple of things just to highlight Greg the man. Uh, suffice it to say that Greg earned, or to mention that Greg earned two degrees, both an MDiv and a THM, while the rest of us were pedaling as fast as we could to earn one degree. By the time we graduated in the spring of 1973, Dr. Van Til himself had been inviting Greg to fill in for him at spot times in his apologetics uh, upper division courses, leading class discussions and sometimes actually doing some special instruction. Um, Greg had also forged a close personal and later professional bond with John Frame during those years. For future reference, Greg's controversial book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, had its genesis during those years at Westminster Seminary. It began life as a paper that Greg prepared for a student discretion group, which was called, wait for it, the Van Til Circle. The subject was a consideration of Matthew 5, 17 and 18 with reference to the civil magistrate's responsibility toward biblical law, including the Mosaic judicial laws. That paper then morphed into his THM thesis and finally became the big book that was published in 1977. Fast forward through the next decade. I was called and ordained to serve a small OPC congregation in Sonora, California, which is in the Northern California Presbytery. Greg taught for a time at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, where again controversy dogged his steps. At the same time, he finished up his PhD studies at USC and was awarded his degree in 1978. In 1979, Greg returned to Southern California and quickly became involved in the startup of a mission work of the Presbytery in Placentia, California. So many controversies, so little time. Let me just pick one. It involved Greg's ordination to the gospel ministry. As you might guess, Greg passed all his parts of trial for licensure and ordination with flying colors. His ordination was scheduled for August 4th, 1974. But at the meeting of the presbytery before the service, and those of you who are Presbyterians and know about these things, you know, you get together 15 minutes before the service to approve the participants and the order of service, and then you begin. But on that particular day, one of the ruling elders from Greg's home church announced to the presbytery that he intended to bring charges, judicial charges, against Greg for alleged insubordination to his session. 
And even though in my judgment it was completely out of order, there were enough enemies that Greg had within the Presbytery, men of power and influence, that they put the ordination on hold. Someone went up and dismissed the congregation who were already seated and waiting for the service to begin with no explanation to family or friends. In the trial that followed in his, uh, with the session of his local church, and I served as Greg's counsel during that trial, the vacuous character of the charges was exposed on steroids, and Greg was acquitted by, it was a big session. Six out of seven men on the session voted to acquit Greg. Not surprisingly, the only man who voted to convict him was the man who brought the charge in the first place, who didn't feel any urgency to recuse himself. And then the session was, or the, the decision was appealed. Now, I can't remember quite how that happened because usually the prosecution doesn't get to appeal a non-conviction. But it went up, maybe it was a complaint that went to the presbytery. Eventually, the appeal or the complaint was not sustained by the presbytery, and Greg was uh, ordained on, in July of 1975. So there was a year out of his life spent simply defending himself from unjust charges. This controversy, unfounded and unjust as it was, left a bad feeling on both sides, both for Greg and for his opponents. And I think these events continued to influence negatively the relationship between Greg and some of the, his colleagues in the presbytery for the rest of his life. Let me say a, a bit about Greg's pastoral service, and here the chronology is going to get a little fluid, but stay with me. For several years, God blessed Greg's ministry at Covenant Community Church in Placentia, which I referred to, a church plant uh, a few minutes ago. The church grew in numbers and in the quality of the congregational life. And those of you who know the uh, newly broadcast recordings by Greg, some of those really early recordings that you can barely hear because they were recorded on a little portable cassette recorder from the back of the room. They came out of that setting as he was preaching and teaching Sunday school in that uh, church plant. A few years later, as a result of a friendship between Greg and a conservative congregational minister who was moving toward Reformed theology and ecclesiology, um, a decision was made to merge two congregations and relocate to Newport Beach, California. Greg was also teaching at Newport Christian High School, and when the owner of that school decided to retire, uh, Covenant Community Church acquired that school ministry, and for several years, Greg continued to work both in the church and in the school. But again, sadly, controversies arose and things fell apart. In the aftermath, Greg was called to become an associate pastor at my congregation all the way down south of San Diego in Chula Vista. He, with the help of others, had become a, begun a teaching ministry called the Southern California Center for Christian Studies, and it was designed to help bring Greg's ministry to a nationwide audience. And again, a lot of the recorded legacy comes out of the uh, work that he did under SCCCS. It became a, a specialized ministry of our congregation, and so Greg was called to be an associate pastor of our church to serve in that capacity. He also gathered up the pieces of that fragmented church after the uh, split and uh, knit them together into a new mission work under the oversight of our session in Chula Vista. Even though he was 90 minutes away, he did not miss a monthly session meeting in Chula Vista unless he happened to be out of town on a speaking engagement. I watched him work up close on the session. He took a sincere interest in the Bayview congregation, and there was a reciprocal affection toward him. Even now, when his name is mentioned, the old timers in our congregation remind, remember him with great fondness. His biblical knowledge was on display. He knew a lot about Presbyterian uh, 
church history and church law. If he had lived 30 more years, he might even rival our brother Strange for expertise in church law. Um, he was a thoughtful listener. He was a compassionate counselor. And he was a great guy to be around. He had a terrific sense of humor. In the Q&A, ask me about the JWs that came to his door. I won't take time right now. He did some really important and helpful work within the presbytery on study committees. Um, he worked on the question of the validity of Roman Catholic baptism as that came up in the setting of the presbytery. He was the one who did the pick and shovel work and wrote the first draft uh, for a pamphlet on homosexuality during those days, which later became his book on a biblical view of homosexuality. He did some really helpful work on the question of spousal abuse and the possibility of divorce way, way back in those days. I said earlier that the OPC was Greg's ecclesiastical first love, and it really cost him a lot to keep that relationship going. I alluded to others who shared some of Greg's distinctive ideas, theonomic ethics, post-millennial eschatology, presuppositional apologetics, who got fed up with that, what they considered to be useless hassles within a church structure, and so they lit out for the territories and became independents, finding, founding their own ministries, sometimes even denominations, not always with great results. Truly, it could be said of Greg that he was a prophet who was not without honor except in his own presbytery and his own denomination. His reputation outside of the OPC grew as his teaching reached from shore to shore. Greg chose to stay in the OPC and the Presbytery of Southern California, but I do remember a number of conversations with him in private, particularly in the later years. He would ask me to remind him why it was important for him to persevere as a churchman, why he should stick and continue the fight. There was a lot of disappointment and sorrow that attended his continuing relationship with his presbytery. I won't say that he never contributed to the problems, hardly, but in my experience, he was far more often sinned against than sinning. In the interest of time and discretion, I'm going to pass over the breakup of his marriage and its tragic repercussions. I will say only this, his abandonment by his wife was the deepest heart wound of the many wounds he suffered during his lifetime. He had married his high school sweetheart while they were still in college, and they were blessed with three sons and later adopted a daughter from Korea. Suddenly, and without warning, in 1989, their 20th anniversary year, his wife walked out of the marriage and the family and refused to heed pleas, both from Greg and even from me, to return. We'll leave it there. Lest any have questions, the presbytery, despite the tensions, looked into the matter pastorally and attached no blame to Greg's conduct. Whatever Greg's faults might have been, he was not one to betray a friend, and that made this particular betrayal hard, very hard to absorb. He continually sought uh, reconciliation with his wife, but she was not willing. Here again, Greg learned how his deep biblical convictions would anchor his soul in the perfect storm of emotions that arise out of such a terrible, catastrophic family crisis. By God's grace, he pulled the pieces together and tried to move on. Despite these heartbreaks, that last decade of Greg's life was the most productive and in some ways the most satisfying to him personally. The work of the study center prospered and expanded and he was in demand as a speaker across the country even traveled to the United Kingdom and even to Moscow, preaching and teaching. During these years, Greg worked on his big book on Van Til, 
an extensive selection of readings from the master with analysis by his able disciple. The book was essentially complete when Greg died and was published in 1998. Again, one highlight out of many during those years. In 1985, the now legendary debate between Greg and Gordon Stein took place at UC Irvine. Sitting in the audience that evening with hundreds of others, I watched the self-styled atheist Goliath demolished by the evangelical David with his Vantillian sling and five smooth stones. It was a holy delight. Greg's heart problems were congenital, but it wasn't diagnosed until he took a physical upon entry into Westmont College. By November of 1978, he was in need of open-heart surgery to replace a defective aortic valve. Despite some complications, the surgery was successful, and Greg resumed his rigorous schedule for another 10 years. A second valve replacement surgery took place in February of 1987. Greg quipped, the only thing worse than not knowing how an open-heart surgery would feel was knowing what an open-heart surgery was going to feel like. And after the surgery, he told me he now understood why people get addicted to morphine. One little squeeze of that dispensing bulb and agony becomes instant ecstasy. A providential irony, in the first two surgeries, a synthetically engineered pig valve was used for the replacements. These valves were known to have about a six to 10 year working lifespan. Greg had gone through two of them, but by 1995, when Greg was scheduled for his third open heart surgery, a wholly artificial valve had been developed. This new valve was supposed to be more or less indestructible. So going into the surgery, the hope was that this replacement would be good for many, many more years, far more than the last two had been. My wife and I drove up from San Diego to Orange County the night before the surgery to see him and to pray with him. We stayed overnight so we could wait out the day of the surgery with Greg's children and parents in the hospital. Other friends from the church were there as well. Initially, the surgery was declared a success by the doctors. They were very, very happy with the results. We returned home to Chula Vista with gratitude in our hearts for God's mercy. But a couple of days later, I received a call in the middle of the night from one of Greg's sons asking us to return urgently to the hospital in Orange County. That evening, while sitting in bed, Greg was chatting with one of his sons, and he simply slumped over, unconscious. He was placed on life support, continued in a coma for several days. Eventually, the doctors reported that his kidneys were failing and that other organ systems were beginning to shut down. They made the recommendation that the family, to the family, that the life support be suspended. And so it was that Greg Bonson passed into glory on Monday, December 11th, 1995. He was 47 years old. He was buried in Rose Hills Cemetery in Whittier. The epitaph on his tombstone is Philippians 1.21, which was the text for what turned out to be his final sermon, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let me conclude with just a few quick personal assessments, things that I saw the Holy Spirit do in Greg's life and in his ministry, things that influenced me at the time and continually come back to me whenever I remember him as a friend, I remember his example. First of all, he was a diligent workman. Many have been astonished at Greg's work habits and productivity. He would work late into the night and then get up early the next morning, studying and writing and preparing lectures all the time. And yet for all of that work, he did, not, he did devote himself to his family and to his ministry responsibilities through that time. Some would say he was driven, even perhaps with some sense that his time might be short. <clears throat> 
I'm not one to say, but it could be true. But more than that, he was following Paul's exhortation to Timothy to do his best to be diligent, hardworking, faithful, a workman of whom the Lord might not be disappointed. Thinking about his personality traits, uh, as early on, as I pointed out, some accused him of being harsh, abrasive, bullying, contentious, and rude. From the days of those Balaam's ass letters on through to the end, these harsh assessments usually came from those who could not prevail against him in exegesis or argumentation, either in person or in print. He was so skilled at setting forth his case. I do remember joking with him one time. I said, Greg, you could win an argument even when you know you were wrong. He smiled, but he didn't deny it. <laughs> he was that good. But he didn't abuse those gifts and skills. The Stein debate is a classic example of suaviter in modo, fortiter in re. This was the most polite and gentlemanly demolition job you will ever witness or hear on tape. On a more private level, Greg was very good at shaping his interactions to the person with whom he was speaking. He knew the difference between an arrogant opponent of God and his word and a seeker with honest questions or objections to biblical teaching. As to his alleged biblical defects, and he would have been the first to admit them, especially in his youth, many people over the years who finally had some personal dealings with him that had heard his reputation and maybe even taken it in, hearing it from multitudes of witnesses, said he wasn't at all like what they had expected him to be. Their assessment was universally positive. And in that line, I was thought, so he is a descendant of Van Til. He's a descendant of Machen. He's a descendant of Calvin, of Paul, and of our Lord himself, all of whom were vilified, and yet often for no fault of their own. At his memorial service, I likened him to the gunfighter in the classic Western movies. You know, the townspeople want the gunfighter to come to town and clear out the bad guys. But once the bad guys are gone, they just don't know what to do with the gunfighter. Sooner or later, he has to go down the road as well. And as I said, I saw him change. Like our Lord Jesus himself, Greg learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He grew in maturity, in depth of understanding, in compassion. He listened in good faith to criticisms and advice, especially those who came from his trusted friends. He died a work in progress. What more can any of us be? One little hopeful postscript to many of these controversies within his presbytery. Ten years after his death, 2005, I spoke at the Southern California Presbytery family camp on the general theme of unity in the church, especially highlighting the importance of minist the ministry of reconciliation within the body of Christ. I used some of the battles within the presbytery, some of which Greg was personally involved in, to reflect on how we should and should not handle controversy. During that week, much to my surprise, two men from the presbytery, who had often been strong critics and opponents of Greg, spoke to me about their reassessment. They'd had a decade to think things over. They expressed real regret, even repentance, I think, that they had not treated Greg better, that they had not been more sensitive to his personal troubles, and most of all, had not been able to reconcile with him before his death. Finally, Greg was a loyal friend. If I was ever in trouble and I could get him on the phone, I was absolutely confident that he would find a way to get to me to render whatever help he could. 
And so I was humbled and so thankful that during those last years, especially, I was able to come alongside him and bring some pastoral comfort. Most of the time, again, by reminding him of things that he already deeply believed but needed to hear again from another voice, he was willing, willing to receive sometimes painful counsel from a friend, from this friend. I remember at least twice he told me, Roger, just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. I may not like it, but you give me advice, and I will follow it absolutely. The story of Greg's life is the story of a sovereign, gracious God working out the principles that the Scripture sets forth regarding suffering and glory in the flesh and blood human being, someone who was often weak, physically and emotionally, sometimes sinfully weak. Greg was one to whom much was given in the way of intellectual and academic gifts and opportunities, and one from whom much was expected, and one from whom much was taken by a loving Heavenly Father. But his life was also <clears throat> a life in which we see the strength of our all-sufficient Savior worked out in the weakness of a man. Greg learned by experience, in a way I and many others have not had to, the ultimately encouraging truth that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Thank you.